Um, so today we're going to talk about incident response awakens, and we're going to talk about common problems that IR teams face, and we're also going to talk about the actions that our group took to deal with these. How many people is, runs, uh, runs a SOC, manages a SOC, and is an analyst? Has anything to do with any of that? Okay, great. So we got a good bit of people here. So about me. Um, so I started off working in state law enforcement, did that for five years, and got bored with that. So I decided to go to a university where there's lots and lots of incidents. So it's a lot of fun. I love it. I've been there for 11 years. I've done everything from just being a general IR guy to um, security architect for the university. And now I manage our SOC, and I'm a tier three analyst when, when I need to be. Uh, again, Storm Center handler for three years, and uh, I'm GSC number 76. So what does our environment look like, and why do we have some of these challenges? So we have approximately 42,000 people enrolled, um, 18,000 faculty, staff, eight campuses distributed throughout the state, um, and we have distributed IT everywhere. We have departments that have their own IT. We have sub-departments of the department that have their own IT. We have 10 to 12 active directories. We have different exchange servers everywhere. And we only manage centrally about 3,000 desktops. So everybody else has either completely unmanaged or managed by different people. So it's, it's quite interesting and fun trying to secure this type of environment. Um, so what are the challenges that typically everybody runs into? Right, staffing. We all have staffing problems. Um, slow response time. So from the time an alert or, or an alarm generates, how quickly are we picking it up? Uh, slow time to collect. The slow analysis and uh, distributed environment, how do we get tools and things in place to help us speed these things up? And then a lot of times we respond to stuff when we really shouldn't have, but we didn't know until we started digging into it. So we had an opportunity for change. There was a Department of Revenue breach at the end of 20, 2012. And as more and more came out about it, uh, legislature was really upset about it, and we saw the writing on the wall for new statutes to come down to make us require them. And we already had several things in place that we wanted to get done, and we used this opportunity to say, hey, now's a great time before these laws come into place to start putting this in effect. And so we had a two-year project. Um, we implemented a lot of new technologies. Uh, the first thing we did was implement a SIM and full packet capture. Uh, we also had a remote incident response tool and uh, we implemented a data discovery system. And then to help kind of bring it all in and allow us to get these things installed, we, had, we developed some minimal security standards where everybody on campus is supposed to have our data discovery tool installed, and then systems that have sensitive data have to have our remote incident response tool installed. Um, so new staff. We were fortunate enough to be able to double our staff. Um, we added two more incident response people. So we have now have a staff of five. Uh, we have, we added two more GRC people, um, had staff of three. And then we had a, uh, public relations person. So that helped out a lot because as a university, they want us to do a lot of outreach to the community. And it was just too much for us to manage that within ourselves. So we added a public relations person, person to help us go through and do these type of things. So we ha had all these people now. How are we going to get them trained up to be useful, right? Um, it's very hard to get someone that already has security experience. So what we do is we do a lot of SANS training. Um, we bring in a lot of product training to, to get them up on products. Then we do individually within our group tech talks. So things that s other people are familiar with, we'll, we'll have a, a bi-monthly meeting where they'll go through and say, hey, I've figured out this tool and let's implement it. And then uh, mentoring. And this is really important for our group. Normally how we do it is we'll, we have all our you know, standard operating procedures and we'll sit people and we'll show them how to do it and then we'll give them the chance to go through it. And then as we're sitting there and watching them, we're always asking these questions. Why are we doing this this way? Why wouldn't we do it this way? What makes sense? Um, you know, and always challenging them to make sure that A, they understand the process and challenging them to, hey, if you see an improvement, let's make it. Uh, and it takes us about 18 months to have somebody completely self-reliant where I don't feel like they're coming in every day asking me questions about how, how do I do this, how do I do that. So it's a long process. 
So for slow response time, the first thing we did was add a sim, and um, we got more eyes on glass. It's, it's just what we needed. And um, we also have automated prioritization based upon where the people are at in different apartments and what kind of data is on their systems. Those are obviously the things that we go to first. So here you can see, um, so at 20, uh, beginning of 2014 to uh, the end of 2014 is where we implemented um, our SIM, and then we got more people. So it's pretty dramatic change from, you know, 2013, it was taking us 29 days on average from the alarm to come up for somebody to go through and triage it. And then by the next year, we're now down to five days from the time an alarm comes up. So just from the sheer fact of us adding more people and uh, prioritization and having a sim, it was a pretty dramatic change. And in the last couple of years, it's it slowly decreased, but not, not dramatically. So we can pretty easily attribute to just getting more people and, and adding some better log monitoring to, uh, to this direct change. So slow analysis, right? It, it's always tough. You're, you're, you're going through and, you know, you want to get faster at closing the, 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 uh, the incidents that you're working. And so things that we did was one thing is we, we changed how we were analyzing. I wrote a post back on Storm Center last month about prioritizing incidents and where to get the data. So for example, the, uh, the top one up here is for phishing. So if we have a phishing incident, the primary, P is for primary in this case, we would look in our uh, bro, bro logs are awesome, uh, full packet capture and SMTP logs, right? And so there, we have lots of other things we could be looking at, but to answer the questions we want to answer, these are the primary things to look at. And so to help guide our people through the most efficient process, not that they're you know, not smart enough to use these other means, but these, this is the most efficient way to get the answers that we're looking for. And so we've mapped all these out, and each one of these, how to use Bro, how to do these, are all are part of standard operating procedures. But it seemed like, and, and I'm guilty of this too, we, we find something we're really interested in and we jump down the rabbit hole which is fun and cool, but it wasn't necessarily where we needed to be um, in, in the analysis process. So this has been very helpful for us. Um, other thing is, you know, just across the industry, this has been happening, is reduce the number of whole disk collections that we're doing, um, mostly due to the instrument response tool. Um, we can remotely grab whatever we need. We can grab memory, um, timelines, all that kind of stuff remotely. There's no reason for us to grab the whole disk. Now, when we do now, it's mostly for compliance reasons, HR reasons, legal, um, criminal investigations, or um, if we have a confirmed loss, we'll make sure we grab a whole disk. So with us collecting less data, we can analyze stuff much faster. And also, full packet capture is awesome. If you guys don't have full packet capture, I, I feel for you. I used to be there. We would have a snort alert, and I'm like, all right, I got one packet. And then I have flows, and I'm like, what happened, you know? And so now you have to normally get on disk to start seeing really what happened or, or make some educated guesses. If you're fortunate enough to have Bro installed, uh, maybe you have a good idea what happened, but without that, um, it can be difficult. And with full packet capture, a lot of times, oh, we can see the guy talked out to the CNC and the CNC was already down by the time he talked out, so we're, we're safe, right? So just those kind of inferences can dramatically speed up um, our analysis process. So, um, this goes through our total investigation, so down at the bottom is the year. So, in 2013, these are actual investigations. These aren't incidents, alarms. This is people collecting data, analyzing it, seeing if the incident's confirmed or not. Uh, so, in 2013, we had 103 um, incidents we investigated, and we had 741 hours spent on, on those. The next year, in 2014, you see a pretty big dip, and that's why... Um, during this process, we were installing all these technologies that we're talking about today. So we were doing a lot more engineering and less responding, and so that's why that number went down. So 2013 and 2015 is a pretty good comparison. You see the, the uptick, right? You're going, wow, why, why, why is this? And the reason partly is we had a couple of big incidents where we had uh, 15 to 20 um, systems compromised all at the same time, so that was a little more complicated for our guys. And plus, we were doing a lot of mentoring. So each time on an incident while we're mentoring, we've got two people working the same incident, so we're getting double time. But as you can see this year, um, we've got we've had our guys in place for several years. We're able to process many more investigations with a lot less time. And this is up to the beginning of August. 
Um, here you can tell from, this is a better graph really, you can see as our people get more familiar with our incident process and learning and us improving our processes and using the tools more efficiently that we're now able to get an average investigation down to about two hours. This is on time. This isn't closing time, I'll talk about that next, but actually when they're looking at it, they can look and analyze the data and determine if an incident has happened and um, proceed on within two hours. So this is a fun one. We actually didn't collect this metric at the time, um, but this is time from data collection to analysis. So we get an alarm and I have an IP address. Now, the problem is, is where is that computer? Um, on a large university network, this is a major, major problem. Um, we have, uh, on, on, and this is a guesstimation, it's about two and a half days on average before we had our IR tool. And the process goes like this. We, we hopefully, we hope that it's in the IP spreadsheet. So we have a list of networks and who's the manager of those networks. It's very inaccurate. Uh, people are always, you know, starting and leaving, and so it's it's very inaccurate. Then we have to check NAC logs. Hopefully, they logged into a, a, a NAC segment that we have username, password, all that good stuff um, for them. If not, we check DHCP, and hopefully, their computer name is, you know, something that we can recognize. It's not student one. Um, and then, if not, we in-map it, and hopefully, we can log into it to be RDP and see what the username is. If that doesn't work, right, so we've, we've already spent 45 minutes trying to track this system down. We have to block it. We just outright block it, and hopefully, somebody's going to scream, say, hey, I can't get onto the internet. What's wrong? Um, so it's very, very complicated, and the problem was is as soon as somebody gets wind of the system's compromise, now you have the possibility of them running AV or logging on and say, hey, I found it, and we delete it, right? And they've just stopped all over your investigation. And this was very, very common. So now with our um, incident response tool pre-deployed, we don't even tell them about it until we can confirm that the incident happened. It's just so much easier. Now, we don't, we're not deployed everywhere. I wish we were. And we still have to go back to the old analysis method when we do. But average day to close, so these are, this is based on a 24 hour day, not a 12, eight hour work day or anything like that. So in 2013, it took us an average of 10 days to close an incident. And as we really got the um, incident response tool deployed mid 2014 ish, so you can see from four and a half days um, on down to how, how quickly we can now close an incident. So it's about four and a half hours. So the difference is, is it's about two, two hours on average for us to analyze, and so it's about two hours for us to go out with the incident response tool, collect what we need, and um, analyze it. So distributed environment, I already touched on a lot of this. Um, a policy for requirement of centrally managed tools, it's very, very difficult to, to get such a distributed environment um, all working on the same thing when there's no way to deploy tools with a single tool. It's very difficult. And so you have to meet with the deans, department's head. Um, we have them do a self-service uh, questionnaire every year. And then we talk to the dean saying, you know, this is what we expect. This is where you guys are at. You know, what should be the next steps? And then the other thing is just to get general acceptance. Um, the tools have to be very easy to manage and self-update because a lot of the, a lot of the small departments have no way to push, um, push things. So they are still sneaker netting things around. So if we can't have an automatic update tool with very little overhead, it's very hard for us to, to get people to install this stuff. So this is probably the most important time saver, and again, it's hard to quantify this. This is unnecessary responses. So previously, what we'd have to do was, if we saw a system was compromised, we would ask the admin or the user, hey, do you have sensitive data on the system? And 99% of the time, what did they say? No way, right? Well, in about 75% of the cases, they did. You know, almost always when we went and collected and did that, they had some kind of sensitive data. Well, now with us having the data discovery tool on all these systems, we can quickly look as, okay, this system, you know, it doesn't have any sensitive data. It's not a critical asset. It has commodity malware. We're simply just going to knock it off the internet and tell them to wipe it. And so this, the sheer untold hours of us not having to go through every compromise that we had on campus um, 
has saved us untold, untold hours. It's been a, a huge, huge asset for us. So key takeaways. Start gathering metrics now. So if you aren't gathering good metrics, it's going to make it much more difficult for, for you and your group to uh, make cases for, for buying things. We already had plans when we had this incident. We already had the plans in place of what we wanted to do to reduce our metrics that we already had. Um, also, it makes it a great case for um, you, you talk to the CIO and he's, you know, he sees, wow, it's taking you guys five days to work an alarm. Let's get that down. You already have that plan in place and you can hand it over immediately. Many times, previously to the DOR breach, we, had, we already had these written up. And literally, every time we'd have an incident, we'd change the date and put that same request in front of people. And they would just keep seeing it over and over. And, you know, eventually they got it that they needed to do this. And it, maybe the first time it was somebody they didn't care about. Maybe, you know, it, it took a VP getting compromised and, and he's yelling at the CIO going, what's going on for him to do this and start, um, start listening. So, so don't give up, you know, and, and make sure you have your plan of where your metrics are at and what you want to do. And it just makes an easier business case for you. Um, staff retention is always a problem. You know, training, making sure that, you know, you're investing in these guys and that you know you care about them. Um, have a progression path for them. Even if you might not be able to give them a bump, there's still always the, hey, we're working on this process. Don't give up. And then quality of life. Um, University of South Carolina, we have a great working environment. We're very flexible. We're not on call a whole lot when things happen. So it's, uh, it's, it's very nice to manage a SOC and not get called at 2 in the morning every day. So um, what had the most impact? That's the question I get a lot out of all the tools. If I had to get one, so we already had a lot of other tools in place, so don't think if you only had one tool, this would be the one. But in this case, the data discovery tool saved us so much time of not analyzing systems. That would be my first choice. That would dramatically reduce how, um, how many incidents we worked. The second is endpoint forensics. And in our case, again, our distributed environment, this saves us a lot of time being going out immediately to reach in and collect stuff. Full packet capture, again, a huge time saver when you're looking at network traffic. And then the SIM last. We already had um, SIM like, we had Security Onion deployed. And so we already had a lot of SIM type features and it wasn't as big of a deal as some of the other stuff. So again, so what do we have next? Um, we want another additional position to manage systems. So we already have that PD written and we're, you know, trying to work on that process. So next time somebody asks us again, why is it down to five days? Well, half, you know, our team is all splitting up our time managing some of these systems. We need a dedicated person to manage the systems and then we can perform more IR processes. Um, automated quarantine, that's just us doing some API scripting for our incident response tool. We can go out there and quarantine them. Um, so again, that'll reduce our time to respond. Uh, do more threat hunting. Um, on campus, and then um, just a better use of our threat intel to respond to stuff faster and make better priority changes. So I want to especially thank uh, our, my SOC guys, our CIO, James Perry, and uh, the rest of our team. Without all their hard work, we wouldn't be able to have these awesome numbers to show people. Questions? These, uh, I'll, I'll tweet out these slides. Um, they'll probably be on my GitHub. So, yes, sir. So, I'm not familiar with the use of a data discovery tool. Can you talk a little bit more about how that works and like what exactly it tells you? Yeah, so um, it, DLP, you know, most people say DLP, right? So you're familiar with that where it's scanning for sensitive data, SSN, bank account number, any of those type of things. Uh, you know, the, the number ones are Denny Finder and then McAfee has their own DLP. We aren't using the prevention portion because at a university I would pull all my hair out, right? But the, the important thing from, from our perspective at this point is that people be able to know what data is on their system and then be able to remediate it. Uh, that's our main goal is for them to actually remove the data. But if they have it, we have reporting and then they have other requirements they have to meet. So, like, for example, do you put in, do you configure it with, like, regular expressions for things like social security numbers? If yes, you yes. Absolutely, yes. So that's what it does. It'll crawl, crawl all the different files and knows how to parse and does uh, regex expressions for, for known credit card, bank account numbers, and however you set it up. Most of them now have a, a, a huge predefined library for HIPAA and all that kind of stuff, and then you just turn those on and have it scheduled to scan either on a weekly, monthly, whatever basis you feel like it necessary. 
Yes, sir. If you talk about reducing closure time for incidents, and you talk about commodity malware and how it's not very, it's not of interest to your team, so you reduce that closure time, and maybe you'll ship it off to someone and say, why reload that system? Are there any artifacts that you collect from those systems so that later you can go back and determine if it was something additional you should look at? Um, so the question was, uh, did everybody hear, hear that question? Um, Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. It, it really depends on how commodity it is. If, if it's something that we see all the time, no. If it's something new in our environment, generally we will, and we feed our IOCs into our um, ticketing system, and then th that gets propagated into our incident response tools and those type of things. But but not always. It, it's I'd say 50% of the time we do. Question. Could you put a dollar value on what it took to it takes 18 months to train somebody? Yes. To make them useful? Yes. Uh, well, it depends on, um, yeah, so I would say we generally would do at least two SANS classes. So you're roughly, you know, 6,000 per that. Um, and then at least two, uh, two other um, training classes. So maybe 10, 10 12,000 potentially. Um, time's up. Do we want to? Okay. Thank you guys. Feel free to send me uh, a, a Twitter or an email if uh, you have any more questions. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, what was the catalyst for us to start this project?